Everybody, I know folks are still going to trickle in, but we do want to keep with time. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, if you are intending to join us for this session, you're in the right place. It's called Beyond the Blame Game, Effectively Navigating LGBTQ Plus and Religious Identities. Uh, I'm Dina Fidas. I'm the Managing Director and Chief Program and Partnerships Officer here at Out and Equal. And it is a great pleasure to welcome um, two organizations and three people that I deeply admire, that I rely on for their expertise. And I know so many of you have come to rely on through Summit. And if you haven't yet, then you're in for a treat and hopefully a set of new conversations. So really excited that we have Leslie Funk here, the Senior Workplace Program Associate from the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding, Jamie Henkel, excuse me, Learning and Inclusion Manager for PFLAG National, and Jean Marie Navetta, the Director of Learning and Inclusion for, for PFLAG National. Uh, welcome and thank you all. I know you'll introduce yourselves as well to give a bit more context. What do we want to talk about today? <laughs> we want to talk about um, the nuance that is actually uh, often misunderstood behind what we talk about as, you know, tension in the workplace based on religion or sometimes shorthanded as religious objection in the workplace. And I think it's helpful to, as you think about situations you've encountered or any situations you come upon in the future, know that not all religious tension is the same. It's not all created equal and it's not all dealt with in the same way. And so roughly speaking, while I'm not here to give you uh, legal advice per se, um, it's important to note that on the far end of the spectrum, the most extreme form of the spectrum, um, if you are encountering uh, bias or outright harassment in the form of, I don't wanna work with LGBTQ people because of my religion or harassment, uh, you know, your quote unquote lifestyle is wrong, there is generally going to be recourse there. Talk to human resources, talk to management. That's not something that you have to shoulder by yourself. Um, I think a lot of what we're gonna actually get into today and why we've called in these extraordinary leaders is this nuance where there's probably some space to do some persuasion work, to build empathy and understanding. Someone saying, why do you have to celebrate pride? Someone who maybe in all earnestness doesn't understand why that is a workplace issue. Um, it could also be an expression of bias. So again, we're not telling you not to speak to HR if you have a concern, but it may be handled more at that you know, ERG level, bringing, calling somebody in to demystify how it is that, that LGBTQ inclusion is in fact a bona fide business issue. Um, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, you've probably got some movable middle, some would-be allies who are thoughtfully dealing with inner conflict. You know, I like my colleague Tom, but I can't ignore my church teachings. Or, you know, I've heard my boss talk about her transgender teenager, and, I, and I've known this teen since they were, you know, five years old and, and care about them as I do my own family, but I'm really struggling. And that's where I think there is this opportunity for individual and uh, leader intervention. Um, so with that, and to really illuminate how you can bring this into your workplace, it's a pleasure to turn the microphone over to, uh, I think Jean Marie Nevada is gonna kick this off and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Dina. Um, and I'm actually gonna attempt to share my screen. So let's see if this works. And let me just go to full screen for you. And Jamie, are we good? Can you see? Uh, is my screen sharing? Yeah, Jean Marie, I was just doing a thumbs up, not remembering that you couldn't see me. So. Can't see. Yeah, yeah, can't see you at all. <laughs> thank you. Well, um, thank you, Dina, um, for the introduction, and thank you for inviting us to be here. Um, this is Beyond the Blame Game, and I'm always really excited to have this conversation. Um, I'll quickly introduce myself and let my two colleagues do that, too. So I'm Jean Marie Nevetta. Um, my pronouns are she and ella, if you speak Spanish. Um, I'm the Director of Learning and Inclusion for PFLAG National, where I lead all of our internal and external education programs, which puts me in people's workplaces about 85% of my time, um, as well as what we do inside of PFLAG. And with that, I'd um, like to introduce Leslie and then Jamie. So Leslie, if you could just do a quick introduction. 
Great. Thanks so much, Jean-Marie. Um, so my name is Leslie Funk. As I said, I'm a senior workplace program associate at the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding, the longest title and, and uh, organization name. Um, I, I use pronouns she, her, and hers and identify as a straight ally. I also identify as culturally Jewish. So I like to say that means I practice my religion in the kitchen rather than in the synagogue and now more so than ever while working from home. So turn it over to Jamie. Yeah, hello folks, uh, Jamie Henkel, my pronouns are she and her, and I am the Learning and Inclusion Manager at PFLAG National, so I'm the other half of Jean Marie's very robust team. Uh, and today I am going to be uh, hanging out with you all in the chat. Um, this is a pretty interactive session. We are going to have some questions for you all we'll, we're, where we will ask you to pull up the chat, send in your responses, and that is also where you can share questions with us. Um, I will be monitoring, queuing up questions for the end, um, answering what I can in the moment, but uh, I, that's, where, that's where I will be throughout today's session. Thank you, Jamie. And Leslie? Great, thanks so much. So just to give a bit of background about the organization that I work for. Um, so Tannenbaum is a secular non-sectarian nonprofit. So this means that we're not affiliated with any particular religion or religious practice, but we understand that religion can be a powerful force in people's lives. And we do our work through four specific program areas. The one that's most relevant for today that I'll focus on is our workplace program. And so through this, my colleagues and I uh, work with uh, corporations, large nonprofits, and government agencies to help them address religious diversity in the workplace, which of course can mean many different things depending on the organization and where they're at in their diversity and inclusion journey. And we'd like to meet them where they are, whether that's working with them uh, through our corporate membership program or ad hoc as needed. We provide a number of services from consulting hours to training to just general problem solving. And I don't want to take up too much time, so <laughs> I'll hand it back to Jean Marie there. Thank you. And really quickly, Jamie and I work um, at PFLAG National. A lot of you may know PFLAG because it's where your mom and dad may have gone when you came out to them. Um, so we are still going almost 50 years old with more than 400 chapters around the United States. Jamie and I are actually the leaders of PFLAG Straight for Equality program, which we jokingly call PFLAG 2.0. And it's about all of those people who have a friend who is LGBTQ, people who have colleagues and um, and people that they're connected to. This is really about allyship and recognizing that allyship um, means allies for people who are straight and cisgender, but as well as people who are LGBTQ um, to be allies to one another. And this is actually where a lot of our workplace efforts actually work through. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Leslie. Great, thanks so much. So what are we gonna do today? So some of this was actually already covered a little bit, I think with Dina's wonderful intro, but what we're really gonna do is start by talking about what we're talking about, give you some context for what we're discussing, um, definitions, some of the lived experiences, things like that. And then we're gonna talk about um, what many people and companies need to work through in order to address religious and LGBTQ inclusion in the workplace. And then how to go forward from there, how to, how to work work as an individual or, or as a company um, to address that intersectionality of identities in the workplace. And we won't let you leave here without having an opportunity to practice what we're talking about. So we'll, like um, Jamie said at the beginning, there are going to be some interactive opportunities. And at the end, we'll really ask for your feedback and your input um, for some real life situations. And then here, again, is, is really where we're covering some of the stuff that Dina mentioned. So we're not attorneys with a caveat that I technically am, but for purposes of this training, it's irrelevant. So I said that, and now you can ignore it. Uh, with the data that we're talking about, there there is some, there are some limitations to what we're discussing. We recognize that. And we are presenting the information as it was presented. So to recognize some of those limitations from the start, it can be tricky to, to find data that covers all the populations we want to do, but we wanted to be sure to include information as best we can and as accurately as we can. Um, when it comes to the topic of religion, of course, there can be a lot of opportunities for debate, for theological discussion. And that's actually not what we're doing here. Here today. We recognize that's a part of the discussion, that's a part of religious diversity, but not a part of the way we're looking to address it today. And more than anything, this is complicated. It's nuanced, as Dina said, and 
discussing identities in general, whether that's about religion, whether it's LGBTQ plus identity, whether it's a totally different identity, they're complicated individually. Then now we're talking about the intersection in the workplace. We know it's even more complicated um, than anything else, um, but we've really identified ourselves as uh, superheroes. So we're really ready to do that today and take this topic on. Um, also, you can see the little box on the side here about terminology. So this also goes to what I mentioned about some of the limitations to the data, that some of the data we're uh, referencing only used and looked at certain identities. And so we're going to use the terminology that's from that data. And we want to be inclusive though at the same time. So if you are able to share and, and do contribute at any point, we certainly ask you to use the terminology that you're most comfortable with. And very quickly, uh, ground rules for the workshop, because we are going to be covering a lot of stuff and sometimes stuff that can be a little bit difficult for people or um, kind of trigger people. Um, so a few things that might help with your learning. Um, if possible, please turn off any other distractions so you can fully focus. I mean, we can't tell if you're distracted, but for your own learning experience, that's best. Please keep an open mind. And this means assume that you can learn from anyone, especially when you disagree with somebody. Um, be willing to step back and share, but also um, step up and share and then step back and listen because we have a lot to cover and a lot of people will want to participate. Um, if there is a disagreement, let's all assume that we are all coming from a place of caring and kindness. And I think let's navigate our disagreements that way. And finally, we definitely want you to have fun. We strongly suggest glitter and sequins all day long. As you can see, I already have my Christmas stuff behind me. So um, we believe in a lot of glitter to keep things fun. And with that, I'm turning it back over to Leslie. Thanks so much. Okay, so we're gonna get into what we're talking about. Um, so in our next slide, we're starting here with the conflicts we see because we can't talk about the topic of religious and LGBTQ identities without acknowledging the very real realities, lived experiences that many people have had and continue to have around conflict and conflicts between these two identities. So while that's not our focus for today, we are going to start by looking at what some of the numbers are, some of the, the information is around this. And so on the slide, you can see a lot of data, a lot of content that you may already be familiar with. But just to go through it um, and, and cover what we have here. Um, so what what we what we know is that although a third of the LGB population lives in the South, there are no statewide protections for LGBTQ plus employees across the 14 Southern states. And in workplaces around the country, a fifth of workers have seen or experienced conflict between religious and LGBT uh, co-workers. And when we're looking outside of the workplace, large majorities of LGBT Americans describe a number of religions as being unfriendly towards LGBT people. And then this perception and experience has, has led to about uh, one third of millennials in particular leaving the religious tradition in which they were raised to now become what is called unaffiliated, so not connected to any religious tradition. And then we see in both the Supreme Court and in other courts around the country, an increase in conservative religious ideologies that are driving a lot of the decisions that are being made that then end up negatively impacting LGBTQ plus communities throughout the country, let alone additional communities as well. So on the next slide, we can see that um, here we go, that we can see some of the ways in which this is playing out in the courts. Again, a lot of this information is, is content that you're probably familiar with. Some of these headlines um, like religion LGBT rights, again, on, on the collision course at high court, things like that, that are um, direct and involve direct and alarming misalignment between religious and LGBTQ plus um, communities. And so these are just some of the examples of the ways in which we're seeing this conflict presented just the existence of two communities, let alone the intersectionality of uh, individuals that might exist across these communities and the way we're seeing it presented far too often and um, as the reality is for far too many people. Hand it back to Jean Marie now. Actually, I'll turn this one over to Jamie to run. Yeah, so this is a place where we're going to ask you all to interact and, and wake up and, and hang out with us. Um, and so what I'm hoping that you can do is if you have the, the, the chat in the participant window pulled up, um, there should be an option for you to say sort of yes and no. You can check 
the green arrow or the red X. And we're hoping that you can tell us which of these situations have showed up for you in the workplace. Um, if you are somebody who says, I've had a direct conflict, conflict specifically and explicitly because of someone's religious beliefs and or their sexual orientation or gender identity, um, click that, that green yes button because I'd, I'd love to get a sense of, of who has had, had that experience. Um, and it does appear that at least one person on today's call um, has had specific and explicit issues because of this, this intersection. A couple people um, are, are saying that now, um, mostly yeses, I'm not seeing any noes. Um, now, I'd like to, to hear from people who say, I suspect that religious beliefs and, and sexual orientation and gender identity were the underlying cause of conflict, but it wasn't actually said. If people feel like they're having that experience, uh, click that green arrow. Um, and uh, that, that, that number went up a little bit faster. I was, I was seeing yeses more, more quickly. Um, and some people who are saying yes in the chat, which is also fantastic, thank you. Um, now, I, looking at option C, um, I'm wondering if anyone who has had the experience where programs offered by their employee resource group or affinity group or business resource group or whatever we're calling them these days at their organization have been protested or complained about um, under the banner of religious beliefs and or sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, so uh, more people are saying, yes, absolutely, this is happening. I've had at least one person uh, who said no in this particular situation. Um, and last but not least, um, I, I'd love to hear from folks who say uh, that, that, that would say yes or no to option D. Um, I feel like I can't talk about LGBTQ rights and or religion and news stories in the office because I worry about negative backlash from the people around me. And this was one where immediately I was seeing yes, yeses pop up. That This is an experience that people are absolutely having. Um, so somebody said maybe, which I think is, is also, um, is is okay uh, and and at least a couple people are saying no so a whole uh, di diversity of experiences here Jean Marie and Leslie thank you Jamie and I think that this is a perfect example of how what we experience and what actually might be happening can kind of be two different things and that it's really important to understand that our individual experiences give us one lens and it's a valid lens and it's a really critically important lens because it is what you are going through but there is a lot of stuff happening around us and sometimes we don't always see that and so that's what i want to talk about as we start with this context of there's so much conflict here um i want to look at what we we actually know is happening around us too so the first thing is views from congregants are generally changing when it comes to lgbtq rights and maybe not as much as we want but it's happening and acknowledging this is really 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 critical to developing a, a greater base for allies. So you can look at this research from Pew, and they, they've been asking this question for, very, for decades, actually, and it's specifically about gay and lesbian people. So this is the percentage of adults in the US who say that homosexuality should or shouldn't be accepted. And you can see what those numbers look like. And we, we, you know, we, we picked a bunch of different groups to look at. They, they survey people across a lot of dimensions. But you can see some of those numbers are pretty high. And in some cases, so high that it might actually counter some people's experiences. And as we start to look um, at Americans who consider themselves to be religious, what we also know is that the opinions of those individuals are really very much skewing in the direction of legislation that is in fact inclusive and equal for people who are LGBTQ identified. So you can look at this information from uh, 2019 and it was asking people by religious affiliation, um, how many of you support uh, non-discrimination legislation for people who are LGBT? In this case, it was LGBT was the language they used. And you can see some of these numbers are pretty impressive. And in some cases, some of these numbers probably challenge a lot of our stereotypes and assumptions about different religious groups. Meanwhile, we are also seeing high visibility for religious allies allies both in and outside of the LGBTQ community. And this is not just about allies who are, let's say, um, supporting people in Unitarian or UCC uh, communities, but we are seeing allies through nearly every religious uh, denomination. People like William Barber, the Reverend William Barber, Father Jim Martin, who's a Catholic priest. We've seen so much work happening among people who are Muslim, both here and outside of the United States. 
And lots of organizations are starting to step up and have this conversation about religious inclusion for people who are LGBTQ in ways that we have not seen in such a robust way in the past. This is also happening at a time in which I sometimes think we all need a little bit of a reminder, which is often when this discussion starts about LGBTQ rights and people and religious identities and people who are religious, we often sort of consider this to be two separate conversations. But here's my reminder to you. There are lots of people who are in both of those conversations. I happen to be one of them. I'm both gay and Catholic. Um, and as we start to look at some of the data around this, we know that about 54% of people who are LGBT um, and residents of the South say that they're religion, religious. If you start looking at LGBT Black folks in the South, seven, that number goes up to 71%. Um, across the country, people who are LGBT and over the age of 65, 65% of people say that is me. And you can see the way the breakout comes in terms of how people identify. So this is a really critical reminder that we are often having these conversations as though there is not this overlapping when in fact there is tremendous overlap. And when that overlap is not handled effectively, we are sometimes double marginalizing people based on religious identity and LGBTQ identity. Um, this research I thought was really interesting. It looked at religiosity, this is from the Williams Institute, um, religiosity among people who are LGBT in the United States as of this year, and, you know, we're speaking in the Southern Forum, so you can only see what those numbers look like. But across the country, there are significant portions of our community who also identify as religious and often find themselves on the wrong side of the conversation. Um, in fact, there's a lot of research out there. One in eight people um, of faith um, have discriminated, uh, have experienced, who are LGBT, have experienced discrimination or poor treatment from other LGBT people because of their religious beliefs. Um, you can see that these numbers go up depending on which group you are actually in. We've had a lot of business leaders who exist in both of these places. Um, for, for example, I mean, because I'm from Bloomberg talking about the two closets he needs to come out of, which are both being a person who is Muslim as well as being a person who is gay identified. So all of these sort of good things are happening and these changes are happening. And yet that is rarely the story that we are being told. And in fact, if I said, how does this play out in business and give me examples of what this looks like, we're often going to get something like the Dan Cathy at Chick-fil-A situation. And we all know the way that that went. Um, uh, an organizational leader who has used his religious beliefs to openly discriminate against people who are LGBTQ. And he has often sort of been pointed to as the example of a business leader whose religious beliefs really steer the ship. And yet we ignore examples like Bill Marriott, who is a man who happens to be um, a, a Mormon, Mormon and frequently has talked about the fact that it is in fact his religious beliefs that drive him to be inclusive and drive him to be incredibly inclusive of people who are LGBTQ. And if you look at the way Marriott's done their work around this, exam this issue, you can really see how this really does change the tone. And yet the one who is getting headlines is the one who is always negative. And I think we need to start holding up some of these positive examples. Because if we continue to have uh, conversations as though the only conversation that is happening is this super negative one about fire and brimstone and Leviticus, and miss all of these leaders and this change that's happening among people who are saying, listen, here are my beliefs but really we do need to treat people fairly, then we will find ourselves in the wrong conversations and ineffective conversations to actually create change. Um, and so it's time for you a question. And for that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Jamie. Yes, here I am again. Um, and so I, we are, we're hoping that you will share um, just with yeses or nos in the chat, or again, with those green, uh, green buttons or red buttons, if you have the participant list open, um, we're wondering if you have observed or experienced any, any of these positive changes uh, when in interactions because of, uh, between people of faith and, and LGBTQ plus people and their allies in the workplace. Um, you know, we, we see the conflict and we, we heard that people are experiencing those things, but we're wondering if folks have had uh, positive experience as well and have seen some of these positive changes. Um, and it looks to me like uh, a, a lot of folks are saying yes. We have um, seven or eight people who have said yes, um, a couple of people who've said yes in the chat, um, and one person who said no. 
know. So I think that this is still uh, a reality where people don't necessarily see um, these positive experiences and, and that, that and that comes to play for some people. Yeah, and you know, if you haven't, haven't actually experienced any of these positive changes, you haven't been lucky enough to encounter what it feels like, sometimes what happens is we sort of remain in that past space and are not acknowledging the potential that's in front of us. And to head on to the next place, I'm gonna turn this back over to Leslie. Thanks so much. So now we're going to get into uh, what some of the stereotypes and pitfalls are that people and companies ideally would overcome in order to address religious and LGBTQ inclusion at work. And so to do that, we're going to start with um, looking through this scenario here. And, and Jean Marie and I are going to talk through what we think we would do, what we would advise, what, what might be going on in this case. Um, and your input is appreciated, but focus for right now is just going to be on uh, how we would respond just to allow for time. So situation here is uh, an evangelical employee is ostracized by team members after she declines to attend an event that's hosted by the LGBTQ plus ERG. They assume she declined because she does not support her LGBTQ plus colleagues. So Jean Marie, what are your thoughts? What might be going on in this case? Well, I think the first word that I noticed in that scenario is the word assumed. Um, I think that right away there is an assumption because we put the word evangelical in, sentence, in the beginning of the sentence that people's heads are going to go to that. And I think the minute that we are working on assumptions, uh, we have to remind ourselves it is just an assumption. You're not basing it on knowledge. You're basing it on one piece of information. You know she's evangelical, but you don't know if maybe she needs to pick her kids up after school and can't attend. So that's what concerns me. Le Leslie, what are you seeing in it? So it reminds me of a situation where there was an evangelical employee who did not feel comfortable being out about her evangelical evangelicalism yeah, about her religion um, because she was worried about how she would be perceived by the LGBTQ plus ERG. And the, the situation I have in mind is where there was, this woman also had a child who is a part of the LGBTQ plus community. And so she wanted to be a part of that in order to learn more and to support her child, but also kind of like the situation you, you mentioned before with Amin Kassam, wasn't sure about how to be out about one or both and, and how that would be received. So I wonder if in some way that might be relevant. And she knows that because they know she's evangelical, then they won't be accepting of her for exactly what you said because of that assumption. Yeah, and I think that makes it really challenging. And we've actually had a lot of examples of things like that. And, you know, people talking about this religious closet to come out of too, and, and the stereotypes that you're often up against on that one. But I think it's one of those great reminders, Leslie, of how easily things can go off the rails just because of our own sort of immediate reaction. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And so in this next one, um, I'll just read it out loud and then, then we'll discuss it just like we did here. An employee has several times misgendered a coworker who's transgender and who recently transitioned. And the rest of the team seems to be doing well with name and pronoun changes, but this one individual who happens to be very open about their religious beliefs seems to be struggling with this. And people have started to speculate about why. So what could be going on in this case? Once again, I think that, you know, we go for what we seem to know. And in this one, I think the piece of information that is, is put at the top is, you know, this person is very open about their religious beliefs. Um, we know there are lots of reasons, and it certainly could be religious beliefs that might be um, driving this, but it could be some other stuff. It could be that they just don't understand yet. It could be that they need some education. Um, I think that there's kind of a lot out there and we're sort of front loading people's assumptions on this one. And I think this is just, and, and you've taught me this so much Leslie, like you got to keep yourself in check when your brain goes to that first conclusion. Yeah, I think those are really great points. And also, you know, even with the last one and this scenario, it could be that, it, you know, it could be more simple. It could be the fact that uh, the employee doesn't doesn't like their colleague and is maybe just being rude, which is never a great thing or a great possibility, never never a great action to, to choose. But it's always possible that that could be part of it. It could be that the person is also um, struggling at the last minute to get it right and just freezes and just messes it up, at, not out of malice. Um, and it's hard to, hard to navigate that with all different types of lived experiences that we've each had and how to approach individuals in those situations when they don't get it right and to to know really to to wonder but to to not know where they're coming from in those cases yeah and you know Leslie I think part of what happens here and we you know I certainly know that I have done this 
is you sort of make, you start stringing these ideas together. Oh, this person is not gonna use the right pronouns. Oh, it's because they're an evangelical. Oh, I've now written them off and I'm not even gonna try anymore. Definitely. And that actually makes me a terrible ally. Um, and I think that that's sort of like, we, but we go to that so instantly sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's easy to want to protect ourselves. And, and it, so it comes from a maybe a safe place, a, a well intended for our own safety place. And, and that's important to recognize, too, because we're not saying people can only be bad or good in this situation or either of these situations or, you know, any any experience. It's complicated. It's nuanced. And this is just one example of what that can look like. I think it is. And I think these are just such good reminders to keep us on our toes about remembering what could be happening in any of these moments and how much what is behind our experiences often can drive this. And so for this, I'm gonna turn this over to Jamie. Yeah, so this is another place where we're gonna ask you all to use the chat. This is a much more open-ended, it's not yes or no, so we'll give you some time to think about it. Um, but we're hoping that you can share that in your experience, what are some of the immediate assumptions you find people who are LGBTQ plus and their allies making when they interact with coworkers who have identified themselves as religious or people of faith? Um, you know, what are what are some of those assumptions? What are words that come to mind that, that you think LGBTQ folks are making about uh, people, people of faith? Um, and I, somebody answered this question before we even got to it, really, um, that, that sort of people make this assumption that evangelical automatically equals unaccepting, um, that people are making assumptions that folks are closed-minded, that they're going to be intolerant, that they're going to be biased, um, that it, there, there's some incompatibility there, um, that re religion is going to be more important than people, that they're going to be rigid, they're going to reject me, um, there's going to be a lot of negativity. Um, it, it, so lots of assumptions being made here. Now, uh, on, on the other side of that, we're hoping that you can also share, what do you think some of the assumptions that coworkers who are religious who are, or, or who identify as people of faith are making about LGBTQ folks and their allies? Um, would love to hear some of, the, some of those words, some of those things that come to mind that you think uh, people who are religious or people of faith um, are making about the LGBTQ community in, in, their, in their allies. Um, right away, somebody said uh, that one of the assumptions that, that they think is probably being made is that it's a choice, uh, that they're choosing their lifestyle, um, that they, they uh, are, are um, they're destined for hell and that, that people want to sort of save others. Um, they want to save them from their fate. Uh, people make the assumption that the LGBT community and their allies want to turn other people gay, um, that they want to shove their sexuality down their throat in some way. So, so also some really negative assumptions that people think folks who are religious are making about the LGBTQ community. Thank you, Jamie. And so you know exactly where we need to go with this. Remember the role that we individually play in these interactions. It is unfortunately time to quickly mention the words unconscious bias to you. Um, so you, we need to ask ourselves as we start to do these engagements, I mean, listening to these, these assumptions on both sides is such an incredible reminder of the role we are playing in either making this better or sometimes making this challenging. And let me just be super clear on this. There are lots of legitimate reasons that people who are LGBTQ and allies have suspicion and have had because they've had a lot of bad experiences and really negative things have often happened to people. I certainly can speak of my own experiences of people, for example, who wanted nothing to do with me when they found out that I was gay. I mean, so that does, and you know, that objection was based in religion. So that is a very real experience, but we have to remember that what we experience with one person does not necessarily determine everything else. So we have to be responsible as we go into this work and it is hard, hard work. Um, so we need to ask ourselves, where do we get our ideas about other people? How many of those ideas actually did we get about the individual that we are engaging with? Or is it a generalization we've made based on other experiences? Um, can our ideas change over time? Can other people's ideas change over time for us? These are the pieces that we actually need to take on if we are truly sincere about creating authentic engagement with people. I'll give you a quick, a quick example of how this can come out. Um, a really, really close friend of mine happens to work in, in the field of DNI. He also happens to be an openly gay man. 
And he told me the story of when he would walk through his office, he used to be based in Texas. If he saw anything religious in somebody's workspace, he just assumed right away that they hated him because he grew up in an environment where he had experienced tremendous rejection because, by people of faith because he happened to be gay. But if you act, when he actually sits down and talks to you about it, he will tell you some of those individuals, in fact, have been his greatest allies. And it was up to him to give them the chance to actually show who they were rather than assume because of one thing that he saw how this interaction was going to go. So we want to switch over to talking about how we now navigate through all of this. So what are the concrete steps that we take to do a better job in this work? Um, you know, it does begin with recognizing what we bring into it when it comes to unconscious bias, but it also has to go with sometimes shifting the way that we are looking at things. And one of the biggest ways that we talk about this is recognizing that, especially in the context of the workplace, we have got to move our conversations into a respectful space. And that means means using the delineation between belief and behavior. Um, people are entitled to and have every right to believe whatever they choose to believe. But behavior is a different thing. These two comments, these two ideas are really, really different kinds of things. And we break this down. We need to recognize the differences and work from there. In the context of the workplace, debating people's beliefs is personal and we, we should not be having these debates. It's not up to me to tell you if your religion is wrong in the context of the workday. We also know that people's religious beliefs can drive behaviors, but not in every case. And I'm gonna give you an example of this in just a moment. We know that every single person has beliefs, but we also know that beliefs can change. And for anyone who has experienced someone who has had an ally journey, for example, a parent who became inclusive, uh, you know, accepting and inclusive, we know that beliefs can change over time. All beliefs can, are subject to change. But when we're talking about behaviors, this is where our conversation is in the workplace. This is the area of fair game. It is not up to us to critique people's religious beliefs, but we sure can critique people's behaviors. Your beliefs cannot drive negative behaviors in the workplace. And I think constantly talking to people about your beliefs are one thing, you are entitled to those and we are not telling you if those are right or wrong. But in terms of how you carry out your everyday activities, we have codes of conduct. We have norms about how we do business here. And that is where we need to hold the conversation because those are tools that we can use for everybody. And just like beliefs, everyone has behaviors and behaviors can change. And let me give you a really good example here about how this interesting delineation can play out in terms of even policy work. So we know that um, overall Mormon teaching, for example, does not really affirm the lives of people in same-sex relationships. They've made progress, but there's still a lot of challenges there. However, statistically speaking, 70% of people who are Mormon believe that people who are LGBTQ should have non-discrimination uh, protections. So this is a perfect example of where belief does not necessarily drive behavior in the way that we expect. So if we are always assuming that a religious belief from a group that may not be positive about this is always going to drive negative behavior or that those two things cannot be separated, we are not working in a very effective space. So we need to start shifting the way we even approach these conversations. But there are ways that we can make these conversations better. And for that, I'm gonna turn this over to Leslie to talk about more of those strategies. Thanks very much. So just as, as you were talking about Jean Marie with this issue of, of where to start and how to support people, how to, how to really um, encourage the behavior to be the way that we we lead when we're engaging with one one another. And one of those things that, that I think is really important to keep in mind is that you don't have to work for HR or be a part of an ERG necessarily to have some ability and, and some um, somewhere to start really with how to engage with one another in a, in a respectful way. And so I say that as, as an intro to this uh, resource that Tannenbaum has called the Competencies for Respectful Communication. And it's a list of nine resources sources that uh, we've highlighted five here. And the full nine will be available. Uh, you can you can click a link at the end of our uh, session. You'll be able to access the full nine. But to highlight some for for this moment, um, one of the ones that that we have there is uh, avoid spokesperson syndrome. Use I. And what this means is talking about our own experiences is something that's very real and something that that can be quite powerful. But for example, I can't speak on behalf of all the Jews throughout the world. That's just not realistic. We don't all do the same thing. It's just not how life 
life works. But I can speak about my experiences, not just in the kitchen, but just generally what it means to be Jewish for me. And so similarly, no matter what our identities are, being able to speak on behalf of ourselves is something that's incredibly powerful and that we encourage folks to do no matter what they're talking about and no matter the context. And the platinum rule is something that you might not be as familiar with. You might be more familiar with the golden rule to treat others as you wish to be treated. But the platinum rule says to treat other people as they wish to be treated, to consider the fact that respect looks different to different people. And the only way to know what respectful interaction and treatment looks like is to ask. And that maybe sounds pretty uncomfortable or weird to just ask someone like, what does respect mean to you? Let me treat you in that way. But it, in application, it's less about specifically asking about what respect looks like and more about saying, hey, uh, do you celebrate Christmas? Is it okay if I use Merry Christmas around you? And I know that's a controversial one. So just figured I'd add that into our already controversial topic of discussion, uh, but there are other ways to do it in less less uh, controversial context. So keep it in mind as something to engage in, something to, to lead with, something to consider when you're interacting with folks around you. And you know, there's so much that we all have to learn, myself included, and that's something that can really allow us to actually um, lead with that curiosity, to do so in a respectful manner, uh, rather than saying, why do you do that? Which might be exactly what I'm thinking, and that might be the tone that I'm using in my head, but when I'm interacting with people around me, instead of leading in that way, I would probably or hope that I would say instead, oh, that's really interesting that you do that. Can you explain a little bit more about how that works for you or how you practice or something along those lines? And there's a real importance to distinguishing that tone and distinguishing the way in which we communicate so that we're showing that we're genuine in our respect, not judgmental necessarily in, in wondering why someone does the thing they do. Um, additionally, identifying and debunking stereotypes. This might be an obvious one. A lot of these might be maybe what we would expect or hope to do. But again, I think it's important to reiterate that uh, being aware of when you or others around you are using stereotypes, relying on stereotypes, it can be well-intended, but it can be incredibly hurtful and, and not everyone will necessarily speak up about it. So in talking about being that good ally, uh, it's important for each of us to consider the ways in which we can speak up and we can address and debunk those stereotypes that are being talked about. And acknowledging and apologizing for mistakes made. So I think this is one that, that can be particularly powerful when it's um, when it's done or the action is taken by a leader within an organization. But really, I mean, leader is not just the CEO. Leader can be anyone who's exhibiting really um, uh, respectful and um, and wise, I would say, action. So if I mess up and I schedule an event, uh, a mandatory event or a conference on Good Friday, for example, I might, uh, you know, there are different ways where for how to proceed. I could say like, ah, too bad, whatever. So it goes, people can, people can show up or not, um, or people can, uh, maybe if they show up, they'll be upset about it, but whatever, it's mandatory, they'll just be there. But what I could also do is once I realize that I made a mistake, I could could acknowledge that to my team, to those who needed to be there and say, I'm really sorry about this. Um, here's some information I learned that it might be significant to people uh, this day, might be significant to people. And maybe I'd share a Tannenbaum fact sheet about the holiday. I don't know, maybe I would do that. Uh, but the other thing might also be rescheduling, planning a different day for the event because I've learned about it. And that's not necessarily always the case. Even at Tannenbaum, we've messed up with doing the scheduling. And so we acknowledge it to the audience, whether that's a conference, whether that's staff who's who's present. And I think that's important to consider that there are many different options and the way in which we handle those mistakes, those accidental uh, mess ups really can really set the tone for for how other people handle those mistakes and um, acceptance of that when people are willing to admit that they've made a mistake, it can really go a long way. And an example of this actually outside of the workplace really is um, in this image here, seeing a group of, of Christian folks who are at an LGBTQ uh, probably a pride parade really and uh apologizing so so they're not necessarily following the spokesperson sy syndrome they're adhering to apologizing on behalf of their faith but the the image and the the concept is incredibly powerful when there's such a history of negativity and, and problematic uh, behavior there uh, to the next slide if we could wonderful so in considering how to proceed, what to do with this. So it, it, you know, we talk about diversity and inclusion as being a journey. There's no one quick fix, which is 
you know, perpetually disappointing, I would say. I would love, I'm a millennial, I would love for there to be a, an answer, a solution right away today by the end of this presentation. But unfortunately, that's not the reality. But what there is, however, um, even though there's not that quick fix, there are a lot of resources, there are a lot of ways to proceed that can hopefully make you and, and your, your colleagues, your company feel less alone in wherever you're at with this journey. So that might be connecting with organizations, whether that's PFLAG and Tannenbaum, or whether it's other entities that are out there that exist to support folks in this space in these journeys and also consider who the change makers are whether that's folks on linkedin people being highlighted here at out and equals conference at any other organizations that exist and are doing really great work around this and knowing the right resources to turn to when you are willing and able to acknowledge that that maybe you're not the right person to answer this or you're not the expert in it is also a, a really powerful move to make and while everything in uh, the world is not just about Tannenbaum and PFLAG. Maybe in this case it is. Maybe it is about referring folks to us and, and considering what we can do to support you. And technically that's, that's what we're here for. We want to support you. So consider what extending that offer and, and um, reaching out to those additional resources can do. And some of, those, some of those resources that are not just Tannenbaum and PFLAG, because we do recognize they do exist, there are others out there, are these LGBTQ plus inclusive religious organizations organizations. And this is something that um, it exists, these, these organizations exist both around the country and around the world. And given our uh, primarily virtual gatherings these days, they're that much more accessible in ways that maybe they wouldn't have been before and, and perhaps not in the spaces where we are all located. So consider looking into these, consider seeing whether it's for you or for colleagues or just keeping it on hand when the topic comes up. But these are these are just some of the the believe it or not, many organizations that are out there. And what can be done in your workplace? So, you know, we're talking about all these great places to turn that might be external and the people to talk to, but there are actually some opportunities within, within your organization that you or some of your colleagues might be uh, positioned or, or willing to, to take action on. And so what we have here is a list of ways to come together. And and when I say ways, I really just mean like activities and projects to, to focus on. And whether that's as an individual or whether that's as a, a leader or a member of an of a ERG group, consider that these are a number of ways that, that folks who are part of the pride group, part of um, a religious um, group, or even just, just individuals interested in this work can, can come together, can find that commonality. And that is often, a, based on this list, it's often around um, supporting communities. And, and that's not choosing a specific community, but saying people need help. And what can we do to help the people in our community, broadly speaking, as an organization or around our organization, around the area that we're based? And even, again, in this virtual world, oh, I would say all of these are, are possible to do. The need for, for food and toiletries is ever increasing these days. Um, supporting folks around educational programs, um, addressing needs across the board around diversity and inclusion. There's so much where there's so much need out there and so much opportunity really, if we look at it from an angle of, of common and shared resources. And our next one here, talking about inclusive practices, again, with a, a work-based focus. This can, this can apply outside of our, our workplaces too, but consider that if we have access to and download or just keep open in a browser, print out, whatever, whatever you need to do, um, some of the multi-faith and interfaith uh, calendars, this can be a really great way to start in terms of um, low-hanging fruit for addressing religious diversity and doing so in a way that doesn't say, like we're a religious organization or even necessarily I'm a religious person. It's I care about others and here's the way that I'm showing it. Here's how I'm uh, supporting the people who care about things maybe that are different than me. Um, and some of these calendars can be integrated into Outlook. So that's a bonus. Um, it can really be the, the lowest amount of effort <laughs> that you need. You can see it's there. You can't schedule an event that day or you want to check with some colleagues to um, confirm if, if a day is significant to them. And then also when it comes to food and dietary restrictions, this is something that is a common challenge and experience that might not seem relevant during virtual times, but in planning for, for the, the beyond the after COVID times, hopefully, you know, 
someday soon. Um, consider integrating these practices, asking if there are dietary restrictions, which can be inclusive to people who are not necessarily religious, but maybe have uh, gluten allergies or nut allergies. It can, it can be inclusive of people far and beyond religious dietary restrictions. And, and that can be a really nice way to uh, expand the inclusion uh, actions and the, the work that you and your organization are doing. And consider what communicating looks like. Again, this is kind of a reiteration of that respectful communication piece but it, it also covers a lot of what we were talking about around assumptions and what are the assumptions we're making when we're engaging with one another or not interacting with one another um, and the resources that exist, again, both within Tannenbaum and PFLAG and beyond. Th there's really a lot out there that we hope we can support you with and, and would love to be able to do so. And now it's Jean Marie. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you for telling me. It's like the, my everyone's dream is to be able to mute me, and all I do is mute myself. Um, so, um, you know, when we talk about this, um, you know, ultimately it comes to leading with knowledge and understanding, and know that this is the journey. This is not a quick fix, and mistakes are going to be made, and we're not going to get it right, but we can get it better. But it it starts with beginning with knowledge of where things are changing, how things are changing, and then how we may need to change the dialogue too. So again, connect with those organizations, um, pay attention to those resources, those uh, faith specific resources, sometimes those can be real lifesavers for people who are struggling, because they will provide people guidance in terms of, you know, there are people who are having this conversation in your community, you're not alone, and here's how it looks like for you. So, you know, making sure people know that, um, paying attention to those change makers, the way they are approaching this work is changing the way the outcomes that we are seeing. And most of all, I think the biggest thing is end this either or. This doesn't have to be one person is going to win and one person is going to lose, or we can only focus on one issue or the other. Both of these issues can and should and must be talked about together, and they don't need to be always started in a negative context. There are lots of people who exist in both of these spaces as both religious and supportive or and people who are LGBTQ. And those are the people who have the ability to make change, but we need to make sure that the space exists for them and know that regardless of what happens next, progress is actually going to depend on, on you and how you behave. So I think we have time to probably squeeze in one scenario. Um, and here's what we're going to do. So we're going to throw one scenario at you, and we're going to have you um, navigate this one. And Leslie, just for the sake of time, I'm just going to kind of keep going through to get this one out. Um, so Thank what we are you. looking at um, when you answer when you answer this one is, you know, what skills did we talk about today that you might be able to leverage in this scenario? And I'll quickly read it out, and then Jamie's going to navigate the questions for us. So. You've recently taken a transfer from your company's New York City office to one based in Nashville. Um, when you're talking to your new supervisor, she asks if you found a church home in your new town. The question's asked in a totally friendly way. And as you pause to answer, she said, and if you haven't found a new church home yet, yet here, you're invited to join me and my family this Sunday. Now, you happen to be Jewish um, and you've been, been attending an LGBTQ synagogue for many years. Um, so here are the two questions. And for the question navigation, I'm going to turn it over to Jamie to do a super rapid version of this. Yeah, yeah. We're hoping that folks uh, can share with us in the chat really quickly um, what some of the assumptions that are coming into play here on the part of the supervisor um, and what kind of assumptions are coming into play um, on the part of you, on the individual that's just, just transferred and identify as, as Jewish and have been going to this openly um, LGBTQ inclusive synagogue. Um, so what, what are those, those assumptions? And we're also wondering uh, if folks can share a little bit about how they might respond in this particular situation, what they, what they might do. Um, and uh, somebody shared pretty quickly that the supervisor may have assumed that you were going to be Christian or, or Protestant in this particular situation. Um, that they're also making an assumption that, that the person is religious in general and practicing a religion actively um, and most likely Christianity. Um, <clears throat> And uh, someone shared that they've actually been in this situation and the way that they responded is said, 
you know, I don't go to church, but thank you so much for the invite. I'm so appreciative. You know, they, they expressed appreciation while also sharing their truth. Um, but somebody said that when they were, they were, when they responded to the situation, they would definitely uh, assume positive intent, um, thank this person, but be honest, not, not hide anything. Um, somebody shared that as an employee, as the person who has just transferred, one of the assumptions that they might make is that the supervisor is overly religious, that it's not, it, that this is a core part of who they are and how they identify and, and how they live their lives. Um, which Jean Marie and, and uh, Leslie, I think those are all great examples. Would love to see responses coming back in the chat, but uh, I, I do know that we, we have to be mindful of time. I, you know, I, I really appreciate all of that. It's very interesting because I think there's immediate gut risk, um, uh, assumptions that we make there. And Leslie, I was wondering if you could just hop on for a second and maybe talk about how you would navigate through this one. Yeah, definitely. I think it's uh, it's an interesting one to consider that that change in location has come up in um, conversations with clients when they're when they're navigating this this location change and how that can affect so many aspects. And I think it can depend on a lot of factors too. Like, is there already a pride group at the um, company? So, is there already that awareness that at least the company has acknowledged the support for the existence of LGBTQ plus folks? And and that might set the tone for if I would feel comfortable saying, yeah, you know, actually, and like what was shared in the in the chat, thanks so much for the invite. It's not something that I do, but but I'm actually looking for a synagogue. You know, may, maybe the person is well connected within the, the interfaith community or within, broadly speaking, the religious community of the area and might be able to provide a good resource or know someone who can provide a great resource. So it might be one of those opportunities where it's kind of like I would be um, crossing my fingers, hoping that it could turn into this really great allyship, like what was talked about, um, and 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 kind of gauging what the response is. So maybe I would only come out as as Jewish in that case, but perhaps not LGBTQ plus in that case, depending on what's going on, depending on how the person responds to to the one closet I would be coming out of. So <laughs> it depends on factors. <laughs> it does. It depends on factors. It depends on how much grounding you have, what your organization is doing, how you're feeling when you talk to that person how you're feeling in general around your courageousness to do this, because this is a very vulnerable conversation for a lot of people. But Leslie, I love your point that this person assumed Christianity, but she might in fact be a really great networker and be able to tell you exactly where the synagogue is that you should be going to. But it depends on us in that conversation to have that conversation differently. And I will note, this is a terrifying conversation for some people because this conversation can also go badly. So it always reminds us there is always risk involved, but in spite of that risk, there are better ways that we can actually respond. Um, we're, we don't have time to do our second scenario, unfortunately, but I want to sort of wrap up with this because we don't have time to take a question or two, which is, you know, we always sort of assume that when we're trying to navigate conflict in the end, we're going to have these sort of two balanced places. But the truth is that any time we are talking about identity and particularly these two identities, it is complicated and it depends on a number of factors. There's no two interactions that are gonna look the same, but there are skills that we can bring into those interactions, which means us behaving slightly differently sometimes that can really change the way that dialogue actually happens. Um, we might have time for a question or two. Um, this is actually a link we had up from the big summit in October, but if you wanna learn more about the work that we do together, um, we do have a link for you that you can jump to, but our contact information is up there. I think we have about two minutes. So Jamie, I didn't know if maybe we had one question that we can get to before we turn it back over to Dina. You know, I am actually, I'm letting folks know that uh, we, they can reach out to us with questions uh, by email and putting that all into the chat. Um, there were one or two, uh, I'm hoping folks will reach out, but I think uh, I will just encourage people to email us. Okay, great. Well, then we will turn this back over to Dina. I just want to thank everybody for being with us. Thank you, Leslie, for being such an awesome person to present with. Thank you, Jamie. Um, and thank you, Dina, and everybody at Out and Equal for having us here. We really do hope that we'll get to talk to all of you because big, good changes are happening. But keeping that momentum going depends on us doing this work. And it's a heavy lift, but I am saying that where we can do this work right, we literally change lives and in some cases save lives. So there's a lot to be gained here. It's hard work, but it's the best work we can do. So thank you so much for having us here. Thank you all.
Thank you. Thank you again. Um, thank you, PFLAG and Tenenbaum and talk about lifesavers. I think many of us who are members of the community owe a lot to both of these organizations. So again, thank you. Um, a quick heads up that in early 2021, we will uh, release a new toolkit on this subject. And we are also glad to circulate the contact information so that again, your organizations can tap into the expertise and the consultation and learnings that Tannenbaum and PFLAG offer. So again, thank you so much. And I hope you'll stay with us. The rest of the uh, forum together is gonna build on these and other skill sets. Um, and so again, thank you and hope to see you on this next panel. Take good care, everybody. Bye-bye.